All right. Really excited to be here. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. The talk is entitled JS Legos. We're going to talk about reusable UI components in JavaScript. So real quick before we dive in, uh, just a brief intro. I'm Tyler. Uh, you can find me on the net under Ty Benz, GitHub, Twitter, if you guys want to email me. I actually have to get on a plane as soon as I'm done here, so I won't be able to stick around for too long. Um, so if you guys have any questions that don't get answered, feel free to give me a shout out on any one of those places. And if you hate my slides, they are in Vim and they're kind of ugly. Uh, there's a web-based slide deck uh, at the link on the right. So my blog, tybenz.com, I posted a link at the top and they're on the conference site as well if you want to follow along with prettier slides. Uh, so I work at Adobe. Um, I was hired on as an intern, and the team I was hired into was contributing to jQuery Mobile at the time. Uh, so I got some background with jQuery, and uh, kind of my crash course in JavaScript was writing theme roller for jQuery Mobile, which was a lot of fun. Um, shortly after uh, that project was done, my team kind of transitioned out of jQuery Mobile in general, and uh, we were kind of repurposed. So our new purpose is um, to kind of kickstart and prototype out these newer product ideas with this kind of smaller R&D team. So we meet with customers and do agile development, and it's lots of fun. But when we started the whole thing, we knew that we were going to um, need to implement some really common UI stuff from project to project. Uh, so we stopped and we kind of wrote this uh, reusable JavaScript framework. It's just this UI component framework, and we call it WebPro. Um, and through kind of interacting with this framework and understanding the concepts under it, I kind of got really uh, into this idea, and so I thought I'd come give a talk about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what writing code this way entails. Uh, so what we're going to cover, we'll go through three different sections. I'll highlight, uh, we'll walk through some examples of different UI patterns, talk about how understanding the UI itself, the visuals, can shed some light on how to organize your code. And then uh, I'll get preachy for a second about decoupling your markup, your CSS, and your JavaScript. And then uh, at the end, we'll hone in kind of on the JavaScript components themselves and some of the requirements around writing truly flexible and use, uh, reusable JavaScript. So UI patterns. Uh, this stuff's fun. I find that's a lot easier to show than to tell. So uh, we're just going to walk through a few examples here. Uh, and I'm just going to throw some UI components on the screen, and we're going to talk about how we would implement these things at a high level. We're not going to do any coding at this point. So just talk about what we would need to kind of make the thing that we see on the screen. So <clears throat> we uh, see this slider, and we want to implement this thing in the web. So we need some HTML. There's two elements, right? We have the thing that's moving uh, that I call the thumb, and the thing that's moving inside I call the track. So the whole point of a slider is that I can have the user drag this little thumb around, and then the position of the thumb relative to the track maps to some arbitrary value, right? And I can hook a slider to mean something more uh, significant than just what we see here. Um, so we could, we could write a slider. We could just have a couple of HTML elements, some CSS, and write all the JavaScript we need to kind of drag this thing around and map the position to a value. And that's fine. But it's helpful if you kind of stop and assess uh, what sort of underlying behaviors are being implemented uh, in a component like this, and are there any useful abstractions that we can make if we're going to roll one of these components ourselves. So, um, in this case, the actual behavior of clicking and dragging something is a really common pattern in many UI components. Um, and actually, jQuery UI has a, a widget called the draggable, which is this exact pattern. So it's just a chunk of code. You pass an HTML element. It sets up all the events um, that would constitute a drag. So you mouse down, you move the mouse, you mouse up. And it makes, sh it makes sure that the, uh, the element follows the mouse wherever it goes. So you get this dragging thing. So that's its own isolated component. We could stop, and we can write our own little draggable and then we could create a slider using that draggable. So here's where the Legos thing comes in, because we're making these useful abstractions, and we kind of end up with these smaller components that can be used as building blocks to make uh, cooler things. So there's actually one more abstraction that we made in our little UI framework um, that we call a drag tracker. And um, so what it comes from is you think about a draggable itself, and that behavior of the item following, or sorry, the element following the mouse wherever it goes during a drag is not necessarily always what you want. It's, it is a common pattern. But what we did is we wrote this little component called a drag tracker, which sets up all the same events that constitute a drag. But instead of being forced to have the, the item move wherever the mouse goes, it just reports these updates, basically, on what the mouse is doing. So callbacks or uh, it's emitting events with some data so that you can just be updated on what the mouse is doing. So it's very behavior agnostic, right? It's just a little component that gives you some mouse data during a drag. Um, and so you can use it for lots of stuff. I just wanted to show a quick example of a little component I wrote. So this is a numeric spinner. 
and I you know, wrote this thing really quick, it does all the normal numeric spinner stuff. I can increment and decrement the number with the arrow keys, or I can click these buttons, or I can press and hold, all that stuff. Uh, one little hidden feature is that if you start a drag on either of the buttons and go upward or downward, you get the value changing. So now my Y change in, uh, in my mouse position is mapped to this integer, right? So it's kind of this hidden invisible slider feature. Granted, not the most discoverable UI, um, but it is a valid pattern, and actually some of the Adobe apps uh, have that sort of hidden feature. I can't remember which one's off the top of my head. So again, understanding, uh, thinking of abstraction ahead of time and understanding these patterns can be helpful. So we can actually write a drag tra tracker first, and you can implement a draggable using that drag tracker. Right now, every time it's reporting what the mouse is doing uh, during the drag, we can just say move the HTML element where it goes, and now we have a draggable. Then we can implement our slider using the draggable. So we're building up as we go. All right, let's try another one. Um, this is a color picker, pretty easy. If we were gonna implement this thing, uh, let's focus on the two elements that are on the left. So we have the rainbow looking thing. Um, that can be implemented as a slider, right? In this case, it's vertical. Uh, so hopefully when we wrote our slider, we thought far enough in advance to allow for that use case. Uh, so now we're just mapping the Y position of this little uh, thumb to the hue for this color. Uh, now the thing on the left is a bit different. It's kind of the square and we're dragging around this circle and the X and the Y value of where the circle are uh, relative to the box actually map to saturation and lightness. Um, so we could write a little widget that does the draggable thing, but it's actually just another example of a draggable whose position maps to a value. So to me, this is still a slider. It's actually a two dimensional slider. So what I did is I went back into my slider and I hacked it to be able to take either a horizontal slider or vertical or both. So now we can have a two dimensional slider and then I can take the X and Y values, map them to saturation and lightness and I've got the whole thing. So my whole color picker was just two sliders and I had to augment my, my basic slider component but I'm pretty much done. So it's these discrete smaller components. All right, let's do this one. This one's kind of fun. So this is a navigation thing that I stole from Khan. I think they were showing off like the speed of their nav here. We're just gonna talk about the underlying state toggling stuff that's going on here. So let me stop that for a sec. Um, so let's define this first. I call this component tabs. Some people get kind of picky about tabs, like they have to have the links on top and you have to click on them. In this case, they're on the left and you're using hover to activate them. Shouldn't matter, right? So the, the whole idea of tabs is I have a set of links that map to a set of panels and when I activate one of these tabs, it's the only one active and it has a, a matching panel that gets activated as well. So if we're gonna implement tabs, uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is it's kind of an unconventional way. So what we did in Web Pro is we decided to split tabs and panels into their own different components. And that sounds weird, and I'll get to why it's cool in a second. So let's just think of tabs by themselves. If we wanted to implement a widget that just handled the tab. So what's the behavior that we need to implement? We have a set of links, and only one of them can be active at a time. To us, that sounded pretty familiar. If you've been around the web with form controls, there's something called a radio button. Very similar behavior, right? I've got this set of options, only one can be active at a time. So we took that name and that underlying behavior, and we created this base class that handles that, that basic logic. So we call this thing a radio group, and the whole point of a radio group is it's just a collection of things, and only one thing can be active at a time. Then we took our tabs and we actually derive it from that, that base class, and then when we went to go look at panels by themselves, you notice it's the same basic behavior. There's, there's a set of panels here, there's five panels. You only see one at a time because only one is active. So the inactive state for the panels and the inactive state for the tabs look really different, right? You can always see inactive tabs, you can't see inactive panels. That's a CSS thing to us. As far as toggling state goes, it's the same underlying behavior. I have a set of panels and I'm only gonna activate one at a time. So my tabs and my panels both derive from the same base class, which is the, our radio group. And then we're able to add a little um, extra stuff to it to be able to link the two, right? So now every time I activate one of my tabs, it's got a matching panel and it can emit a notification or activate a specific panel that matches it. So I've got these things decoupled. So again, it sounds weird to split up tabs and panels. Uh, the biggest reason why we do it is because we've gotten into situations before we have a comp come to us and we realize that they're just toggling a lot of states, a lot of fancy tab stuff, but you might actually need two different sets of panels to be driven by one set of tabs. So you have this flexibility where I've got, you know, these tabs up here on the page, I've got a panel that's being toggled down here and then a panel way over here, um, but the, the tabs are driving all of that. So when you decouple those, you can do more flexible things. Um, so that's tabs. So one other thing I, I 
like to talk about with tabs is uh, different names for the same thing. So all of these examples on this page are actually being driven by the same uh, exact component. So we have our traditional tabs on the left. Accordions, though the, the markup is arranged a little differently and there, there's a lot of like animation stuff going on, it's the same thing. I have a set of links that map to a set of panels and I'm only activating one at a time. Slideshow is actually the same thing. So the, if this, you know, these should be images, they're just numbers now. Uh, but the idea is that I've got thumbnails on the left-hand side and my actual slide on the right, and whenever I activate a thumb, I get the matching slide. And then I, you know, I've got some extra stuff from my slideshow component that allows me to autoplay and iterate through uh, my, my, my thumbnails or the tabs. So just a little thing to kind of open your eyes when you, when you think of these components, because a lot of UI frameworks actually implement these things in uh, different ways, and you end up writing a lot of the same code because you're managing some of these base level behaviors um, like our radio group. So all of this is cool, and the whole point of coming to understand these patterns is one, making these useful abstractions, and two, not running for the door when your designer sends you a comp like this. So this is something I just found on Dribble. It's this funky new UI, and you, you see something this as a front-end developer, and you kind of think, holy crap, what am I gonna do with this? Um, so, First thing you do is you take a deep breath and then you remember your UI pattern. So if we, if we think about, first we gotta get the HTML and CSS out of the way for this thing, which admittedly is the hardest part. Um, but then when we talk about the JavaScript that's driving this behavior um, and the state toggling stuff, it's actually all stuff that we have together already. So the, these uh, eight icons are arrayed around this circle and I can activate one of them. Uh, I think he meant it to be a touch experience. We can think of it as just mouse. So might need a little bit of JavaScript to say when the mouse hovers over one of these things, move this little blue selector, and then you can click on one of them to activate it. So activating one of them just toggles some state in other places on the, on the page, right? So when I activate that volume, I get a different uh, state in the middle of the circle. When I activate the Wi-Fi, same thing. So I can actually think of these eight icons as tabs. I can think of a set of panels being in the middle of my uh, circle there, and now I've just got a one-to-one -one relationship and I have tabs and panels. In addition, there's some uh, state being changed around the circle, and we can think of those additional uh, elements as living inside their own separate set of panels. So now we, again, this is an example of one set of tabs, two sets of panels. We have a set of panels in the middle of the circle, and then a set of panels that gets overlaid on top of the circle. And then you need some stuff to you know, handle the button sliding out, which is probably just CSS. And then something like this, uh, this volume slider here, admittedly, is a little more complicated. So we could use something like our drag tracker um, and, and have this sort of dragging motion happen around the circle and then map the X and Y position to a radius or something and use SVG to draw uh, a circle or something. It's a little more complicated than normal uh, HTML. You probably, I think you definitely need SVG for this. So the underlying JavaScript, though, we already have, right? We have tabs, we have panels, we have a slider. Might need to tweak some of it a little bit. Um, but overall, when you come across a new fancy UI, um, usually it's implementing the same underlying pattern. So, so this is just kind of helpful tips to not, not freak out. All right, let's talk about decoupling code. So uh, in general, these, the, these are guidelines, okay? There are always rules where you, you, or places where you might need to break these rules, but this is how I think of it. So HTML is the structure of your app. Uh, CSS is the style. CSS should also be where your animations happen. These days, animations and transitions are really well supported. Uh, check your platform for sure, but in general, I use CSS for all my transitions and animations. Uh, and then JavaScript is just the behavior and interaction. So what this means in practice is that style should only happen in your CSS. Uh, so uh, what I mean by this is style shouldn't be happening in your JavaScript. So using jQuery's.css method, for example, if you're just toggling state, doesn't make a lot of sense. Keep, your, keep what your visuals look like in CSS and use add class and remove class and things like that and everything will go much smoother and we'll do an example in a second to show why. Uh, in addition, animation should only happen in your CSS. So there are definitely cases where uh, you have to break this rule but in general, putting your CSS or your animations in CSS is much cleaner and again, you can, you can drive these things uh, by doing add class, remove class and you can actually bind to the animation end and transition end events. Uh, and then lastly, JavaScript should care as little as possible about your markup and the structure. Um, there always has to be some link, uh, but we'll get to ways around making that link very tight. You want it to be a loose 
uh, dependency on how much your JavaScript has to know about the structure of your markup. Uh, so let's do a quick example. Sorry, too much code. Let's go over here. So this is just a uh, little to-do list thing. I can pump this up real quick. Really basic. We're, all we're going for in this example is just checking off a to-do, and then it's marked as completed, and that's it. So let's just talk real briefly, if we wanted to implement that basic behavior, how we would decouple the code. So here's the markup, and we'll walk through this. Um, we have the task list. Uh, we have a task that just consists of a checkbox and then a label for that checkbox. Um, so that's all the markup has. We switch over to the JavaScript, and this is the behavior that we're looking for, right? So first thing I do is I grab the checkbox that has to be inside of a task. And then uh, on the change event, I'm going to check to see if it was actually checked off. And if it was, I will uh, grab my parent task, and I'm going to add a completed class to it. So I just got the checkbox checked, and now I'm just going to mark the task as completed. And I'm going to let CSS decide what that completed state looks like. Um, so we can take a look at the CSS. It's pretty basic. This is my basic task thing. And then here's the completed state. It's just display none in this case. Um, so the nice thing about this is that any, at any point, if I need to change the visuals of my application, it's all isolated to my CSS. I don't need to go hunting into JavaScript to find where I call jQuery.css or anything like that. Um, so I can change things, and I, I just have to change it in one place. So here's an example of doing an animation in CSS, uh, like the example we just saw. So instead of display none, now my completed class has some end properties, and then this, this uh, keyframe animation fade out that takes one second. So the fade out animation does fades the opacity for the first part and then shrinks the height for the second. So all I had to do was update my CSS, and the JavaScript doesn't care because it's just adding a class. It's just a state marker. Uh, cool. So let's talk more specifically about the JavaScript <coughs> and kind of uh, what requirements are around writing truly flexible and reusable JavaScript. So uh, the two big ones are options and events. And what I mean by this is you write a, dra a JavaScript component, you want to make almost everything possible events, have a really robust set of events, but also a set of sane defaults. You always want some default behavior so that the user doesn't have to know every single possible event um, that can be overridden. And then uh, with the events, you want to trigger an external event anytime something significant happens within your component. And this leaves the door open for communication between components for anyone who's interested can listen onto these events and, and extend the basic behavior. Uh, so we'll get to an example in a second. So real quick, before I show the example, I just want to talk about the inheritance. We're going to go through some code, and I want to show you uh, what my base class was and some of the, the basic behavior that all these components share. Uh, so this is my base class. So I'm using John Resig's simple JavaScript inheritance here. Uh, so all that means is I'm defining a class by using class extend, and init, or init is my uh, constructor. So the constructor for my base class takes an element and some options. It stores the element in a jQuery object, and then it takes the options and it overrides any of the defaults and then stores that result. Uh, in addition, it provides a couple utility methods to do the event uh, emitting and event binding. So in this case, it's just using jQuery's thing. This is a cool hack in jQuery, if you guys didn't know this already. You can take a plain JavaScript object, wrap it in a jQuery call, and then you can actually emit events and bind to events on a plain JavaScript object instead of a DOM object. So kind of cool. So you can pass messages between uh, regular parts of your application or, or component. Um, so let's take a look at the example. So I wanted to come up with something really simple for, um, <coughs> for the sake of brevity. Like, I don't want a ton of code on the screen. So the basic behavior I came up with for our sample component is just adding and removing a class. Um, so we're going to mouse down. Like, when something mouses down in the element, we're going to add the class. And when the mouse goes up, we'll remove the class. So mouse down, add. Mouse up, remove. So this is what it looks like. So I've got some animation going on here, but all I'm doing is adding a class and removing a class. That's all we're going for. So in this case, I'm using it to hide and show something. So I call this thing our secret component. Um, so this looks like a lot of code to do what we just saw. Um, but you'll see that if you build it out a little more robust, you get, you get more bang for your buck. So let's, let's walk through what this thing is doing. So the first thing our constructor is we call our parent, so we get the this dot dollar element and the this dot option set up for us. And then uh, we're doing an event binding. So we're actually, notice that the event that I'm binding to is a lookup into my options. So I said it was mouse down, add a class, mouse up, remove a class. But that event name is actually stored in an options object. And now I have the ability to, 
to tweak that. So this is where the option thing comes in. You have this basic behavior, this basic idea, rather the component should act, and uh, you can actually leave the door open for someone else to, to tweak that by, by just making it an option. So up here are my defaults for this component. The class name that we're gonna be adding and removing is actually an option. By default, it's show. And then the events in which we add the class and remove the class are also options. So default is mouse down, mouse up. So again, I'm binding to mouse down, uh, and then I'm calling this method apply that's on the, uh, <coughs> that's on the component. So apply is just doing, grabbing the element, calling add class, and then the class again that it's adding is a lookup. In this case, it's show. Uh, so I just map to mouse down, call apply, and then I trigger an event to tell anyone that's interested, hey, I just applied this class. And then I do the same exact thing for remove. I bind to this remove event, I call remove, I trigger an event. So that's the, um, that is the reusable way to write this component. That's the way that I've found works. And uh, let me show you some examples of what adding a ton of options and a ton of events can do for your application if you want to extend the behavior. So here is... Uh, two of these components that I have on the screen. Notice that the one on the right behaves the same as it did before, and the one on the left does, but it's also driving the one on the right. So now I have this master-slave relationship, right? Not the most impressive or useful demo, uh, but the whole point is that I took the basic behavior, which was add a class, remove a class, and because I have these events, I can actually take advantage of them and have communication between two instances of the component. So this is the code that ran that runs what you already have. So we have our secret class set up, and we just instantiate two of them. So one is the one on the left, two is the one on the right. We uh, bind to secret one's secret apply event. So whenever it's applying, it, it emits this event, and then, we can and then we can reply by saying secret two apply. So whenever secret one applies, secret two applies. Same exact thing for remove, right? So now I've got this master-slave thing. It's whatever. Uh, it's a good example of of how these things can communicate with each other when you leave the door open with these events. Um, so next I wanted to show <coughs> how we can take advantage of some of the options. So the options that I had available in this component were the class name and then the events in which we're adding and removing a class. So I kept coming back to using mouse over instead of mouse down to add and remove a class, and then I kept thinking about um, animation timelines and scrubbing scrubbing an animated GIF. So what I did is I found an animated GIF, I broke it up into its 91 different frames, and I kinda did some HTML and CSS stuff, and I just instantiated a bunch of these different components. So there's these little invisible slices, and I'll show them to you in a second, overlaid over this image, and whenever I'm hovering over one of them, it's actually just adding a class, and that toggles a certain frame of the animation to be shown. So this is the result. As I hover over, I can scrub the animation. So the position of my mouse, is uh, directly mapped to what frame of the animation is being shown. So this is the debug mode. Again, there's just 91 different slices on top of the image. Each one of them, or only one of them, can be active at a time. And now I have this, uh, a matching image for each one of them. It's basically a child element, and I'm using CSS to say whenever this class is actually applied, show the image. Um, so that's all I needed was some HTML and CSS, and here is the code that runs that example. So I'm just iterating over each slice, there happens to be 91 of them, so no, this is not the most performant, most smart way to write an animated GIF scrubber, um, but it does work. So I iterate over all 91, and for each one, I instantiate one of these secrets, I pass it the element, and then I just override those, those default options, which are mouse down and mouse over, or with the defaults are mouse down and mouse up, and I do mouse over and mouse out, and that's it. Um, so you can add a lot of power to these components if you uh, take the time to buff them out with options and these external events. So quick recap, blanket statement I should have made uh, a long time ago is this is reflecting uh, us who, you know, we were rolling our own UI components basically. I know that a lot of you guys don't have the time to do that. So if you are out there looking for a good third party UI component system, this is a good rule of thumb of things to look for. Um, you want highly configurable and you ideally want your JavaScript to depend uh, very little on what the HTML and CSS are doing, and that's one of the awesome things about this, is we can take the same JavaScript and move from project to project, and we might have different constraints around the markup and the CSS, and we can still use the same underlying JavaScript because our JavaScript is all about these patterns and these behaviors. Um, so I think that's it. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, WebPro, the framework that I talked about that we use at Adobe, is not open source, but I've been kind of kicking the tires 
with a little open source project. Um, so if you guys want more code samples of some of this stuff, you can hit this link. Um, it's also posted on my blog if you just hit tiebends.com. Um, and it's just some more samples of kind of the components that we saw, and you can dig into the code and take a look. So thank you, guys. We have, oh, sorry.